Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Mackenzie, and I am the Community and Provider Education Coordinator for NAMI Maryland. I will be the moderator for our webinar today, along with my colleague, Gabby. Public health and safe, public safety workers experience a broad range of health and mental health consequences as a result of work-related exposures to natural or human-caused disasters. Combined with long hours of work, frequent shifts, poor sleep, physical hardships, and other negative experiences, there has been an increase in cause, cases of high stress and trauma. Today, we are hosting two special guests, Lieutenant Stephen Thomas and Michelle Warshire, who will discuss first responders' high exposure to stress and trauma and how these events impact them personally and professionally. In addition, this workshop will explore critical incident stress management and how it can help mitigate first responders' crisis reaction and assist in their resiliency going forward. Before we get started, we wanted to note just a few housekeeping points. To avoid background noise, all participants will be muted for the duration of the webinar. We will be addressing questions at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions as the webinar continues, please enter them into the questions box, which is located on the right-hand side of your screen if viewing from a computer, or at the bottom of your screen if viewing from a phone. We will be reviewing questions as they come in, and if something in particular is unclear or needs to be expanded upon, we will ask our speakers to do so when the question is asked. If you have any comments or concerns during the webinar, please also enter these into the, into the questions box. We will review and address any immediate needs as they occur. A recording of this webinar will be emailed to each registrant tomorrow. The rec recording will also be available on our website at www.namimd.org for any individuals that were unable to register. One hour of CEUs are available for Maryland Police, Corrections, and EMS professionals. Individuals pursuing CEUs must attend the whole webinar and submit the survey that will be presented to you at the end of today's webinar. A certificate of attendance will be sent to each registered participant tomorrow afternoon. After the webinar today, you will be asked to complete a short survey on the aspects of this webinar that you felt were helpful, could be improved, and what you would like to see in future webinars. Each person that completes this survey will be also be entered into a drawing to win a $25 Amazon gift card. This is only one webinar in a series of educational webinars that NAMI Maryland plans to host. We plan to host four more webinars in this series between now and April surrounding topics of recovery, creating a peer support team, cumulative trauma, and compassion cultivation. We ask that you please fill out the survey to let us know how NAMI Maryland can best support you during this time. I'd like to now welcome our speakers for today's webinar, Lieutenant Stephen Thomas and Michelle Warshire. Lieutenant Stephen Thomas has a BA from UMBC in Political Science and Sociology, and an MA from the University of Baltimore in Legal and Ethical Studies. He started as a patrolman with the Anne Arundel County Police in 1996, where he remained in patrol until he became the CIT and Peer Support Coordinator in 2016. In 2020, the Anne Arundel County CIT Unit was named CIT International CIT Unit of the Year. He is the Anne Arundel County International Critical Incident Stress Foundation Team Coordinator. Further, he is an ICISF approved instructor and in the spring of 2019 received the ICISF Pioneering Spirit Award at their World Congress. He is a Youth and Adult Mental Health First Aid Instructor, and at the 2018 Mental Health First Aid Summit in Washington, D.C., was named a Top 100 Instructor. In 2019, he was awarded the Police Assisted Addicted Recovery Initiative Leadership Award for his role in a developing and implementing Anne Arundel County Safe Station Program. Michelle Warshire is the Education and Training Curriculum Specialist at the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation based in Maryland. Michelle is an ICISF approved instructor for both the group and individual crisis intervention courses and instructs the online suicide awareness and introduction for first responders course. She is a member of the Anne Arundel Police Department Critical Incident Stress Management Team in Maryland and Michelle has worked with the juvenile system 
and in the public school system. Michelle instructs as an adjunct faculty at the local community college, teaching psychology and lifespan development. Michelle currently serves on the editorial board of the International Journey, Journal of Emergency Mental Health. Michelle also conducts suicide awareness outreach programs with the military community and veterans groups. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. So, but as we start, we just want to um, let everyone know this class contains proprietary material protected by copyright, duplications prohibited without permission. Um, material within is informational only and is not designed to serve as or be a substitute for, for professional counseling services. Additionally, segments of the presentation are from the ICISF Foundation's Group Crisis Intervention and Assisting Individuals in Crisis classes written by Dr. George Everly and Dr. Jeff Mitchell. And again, this class is not a substitute for those classes. So as we start, um, simply stated, crisis is a state of heightened emotional arousal. It's a state of emotional turmoil. And that's where we define crisis as an acute emotional reaction to some powerful stimulus or demand. Later on, we'll talk about it's when we recognize it. It's not the incident we're looking at. It's the person's emotional response to that incident. So in a psychological crisis, we have an acute response to a trauma, disaster, or other critical incident. And sometimes our psychological homeostasis or balance is disrupted. Um, this causes increased stress because our usual coping mechanisms have failed. Um, there's often evidence of significant distress, impairment, and dysfunction, which makes it difficult for people to continue on leading their normal lives. So this really, this graphic is a simple um, illustration of that. Normally, we th our thoughts, we think more than we feel. However, in a state of crisis, we start to, our feelings are greater than our thoughts. And, and an easy example of this, think back to last Wednesday, um, the incidents that happened in Washington, D.C. And for a lot of us, we started feeling more than we were thinking. It's an emotional event. Some characteristics of a crisis, um, it's an acute emotional reaction to a powerful stimulus or demand. Um, it disrupts our psychological balance. And again, our usual coping mechanisms fail. Um, so it is individual to each person. So what may be a crisis to one person may just be another day to another person, or something may be a crisis to a person one day and then if it happened again a year later or a year before, it would not be a crisis for them that day. It's individual to the person and it's individual to the situation. So, and if we talk about crisis and stress, they're related. It's when um, a person's in an emotional crisis, there's also a state of mental and physical arousal that goes along with the state of emotional turmoil. And think about how our bodies react. Think about as, um, the chemicals within our brains um, react to a, st uh, a stressful situation and we go into a heightened state of alert. It affects us emotionally, mental, mentally, and physically all at the same time. So we, we live in stress every day. If, can you imagine if we didn't have any stress in our life? So there's a balance between our good stress and our bad stress, our eustress and our distress. Um, so it's a state of arousal from mild to extreme, but it helps us stay healthy. Um, and we have stress even when we're not in crisis, but we can't have crisis without stress. And you can look at the different things. You can look at the good stress, the bad stress, and one simple example is you can look at the eustress as going to Disney World and the distress of worrying about how you're going to pay for it. So critical incident stress is the 
all the reactions that go along, um, the emotional, cognitive, and physical reactions that result from an exposure to a powerful, terrible, awful, horrible, sometimes grotesque stimulus that we're exposed to, um, and it overwhelms um, our ability to cope. Um, and it causes an overwhelming demand on our physiology and um, our circumstances to remain in homeostasis. So it can often lead to dysfunction. So it's a state of heightened cognitive, physical, emotional, and behavioral arousal that accompanies the crisis. So we have to remember that the critical incident stress follows the crisis, but it may not follow everybody's um, critical incident. So the stress and the crisis are individual. So then we ask, what do we do um, to help? So crisis intervention is a temporary, active, and supportive entry into the life situation of an individual or group during a period of extreme stress. Crisis intervention is how can we help that person with their stress reaction to whatever that incident is? Um, so when we go and look at specific populations with PTSD, um, law enforcement, 10 to 15 percent of law enforcement have diagnosed with PTSD and fire suppression. So it could be fire service, ambulance service, um, 10 to 30 percent, Vietnam veterans, 16 percent. So uh, PTSD in for Iraqi war, war veterans, 12%. Um, but 20, the 25 for depression and other problems combined. And then one of the questions people ask, well, how come law enforcement's numbers aren't as high as fire departments? And some of the examples I'll give is fire department is more exposed to more incidents. And what I mean by that is if as a police officer, I respond to a SIDS baby. If the fire department's there first, I may not have any contact with that child limited, as in the fire department's going to be doing all the emergency medical for that child. However, if I'm there first, I'm going to be helping the child, and then the fire department's going to take over for me. Think of a car crash, the same, similar. If fire department's there before police officers, Police officers may never be hands-on with the victims of that crash. Um, so that's why they have more exposure to these traumatic incidents. So we know with PTSD, there's a dose-response relationship. So the more doses of trauma that you receive, the higher your chances of developing PTSD. So when Steve refers to the, um, the amount of exposure that's that's where that comes from so now we're going to look at suicides tracked by and this is suicides in law enforcement these numbers are from bluehelp.org but look at the numbers of how they go up in 2019 228 law enforcement suicides last year 171 So some of the statistics, there's 870,000 plus sworn law enforcement officers in the United States. Um, 17 per 100,000 complete suicide a year. Whereas in the general population, only 10 people per 100,000 general population complete suicide. Um, so in 2020, 171 officer suicides officers are three times more likely to take their own life than they are to be killed by a felon um, in an act of violence. So in a 2012 study from the Badge of Life Foundation, some of, the, some of the statistics that are there, the average age of officers dying by suicide was 42. Average time on the job was 16 years. 15 to 18 percent of the officers suffered from post-traumatic stress 91 percent were male 63 percent were single 11 percent um, were military veterans an important part to realize 91 and a half percent 
a firearm was used. And we'll talk more about that in, sa in the safety part. Um, in 83% of police officer suicides, personal problems appear prevalent prior to the suicide. 11% had legal issues pending and California and New York had the highest reported police suicides. So as we look at, and this is for emergency medical service, again, for fire, but when you look at contemplation, the suicidal ideology where 37% of, of people in EMS have contemplated suicide versus the general population of 3.7%. And then when you look at the average of suicide attempts of 6.6% in EMS versus one half of 1% of the CDC national average of the general population, it shows that there is a problem with first responders between police and fire of having suicidal ideation and the suicide attempts as well as completion and suicide. So some of the risk factors that are there, relationship problems, family stress, um, and think of the stress that's there as we talk, and a lot of them are interrelated, but think of the stress that happens just because of the work schedule itself. Think about, and I can tell you in patrol for, in my department, when, when I was in patrol, when I worked six days in the evenings, you may not see your family for six days. Think of the events that you can miss where you going to your, being there for your child's first day of school, putting, taking them to school or attending sporting events, being a family event. Um, I, I know there's times that, that families, that spouses feel like they're um, a single parent during holidays on Christmas Eve, if the spouse is working, the other parent is home preparing everything for, for Christmas day themselves. Um, any holiday, it takes an effect. Um, so it goes along with the departmental stress, the shift work, the extremes. Um, there's been studies that have shown that when officers are in lineup, their pulse rate increases because it's that their, their body reacting, knowing that they were going to be out in that heightened arousal. The alcohol abuse, the sitting in the to dumb the numb the pain from some of the traumatic incidents that we go to, the mistrust in management. You look at financial problems that can occur to officers. Um, a lot of officers depend on second jobs. They depend on overtime. If they're injured or something happens where they can't do the overtime work the second job, it leads to financial stress. Isolation, separation. Most police departments, officers ride by themselves. So you could be out at a horrendous call. You could be at a, working, working, get a call, respond to a SIDS baby have to perform CPR on a deceased child, and then you're in your car by yourself working on your computer, typing your report with no one to ventilate to. Illness and injury. Unfortunately, it happens to officers because it's the nature of the job when you never know what you're going to be thrown into. Um, depression. Again, the amount of trauma that we are exposed to. Any time that incident shocks your conscience, it makes the hair in the back of your neck stand up. And it's those incidents that, where you have innocent victims that are mistreated or abused. Um, and what I mean by incident, innocent, it could be a child, it could be an elderly person and someone that's vulnerable. And then you throw in involvement in high profile critical incidents. They receive negative media attention, things within the criminal justice system, pressure from uh, state's attorney's office and other legal means. Um, firearms are the most used means of suicide death. Um, they're used in 5% of attempts, but responsible for 50% of the deaths. And they do have a 90% fatality rate. Um, firearms 
as a means of suicide, leave no time to reconsider. You can't, um, you know, once the trigger is pulled, that's that. There's no really uh, second guessing that. And in homes with firearms, 83% of gun-related deaths are by suicide, often by the non-gun owner. So that could be um, children, um, you know, teenagers, young adults, anybody else in the house. Um, and anytime you you mix that with a uh, mental health issue, it becomes dangerous. So of course, all police have access to firearms many first responders have access to firearms. So now we ask the question why? And so many officers work hard to disguise the symptoms of being perceived as weak, therefore they fly under the radar. A lot of first responders, specifically police or type A personalities, we wanna show, put that perception up that we are there, we're tough and we can handle anything. The stigma of mental health, which isn't just in first responders in the community as a whole. And one of the things that you, we, at least I pray will happen in the future is when people refer to going to mental health therapy the same way they talk about going to physical therapy, that there won't be a stigma and there will be that same response that it's looked upon. Um, officers, firemen don't seek help when they need it. Um, so, also, some of the other things, because they're involved in the system, um, knowing about emergency petitions, a fearful of losing their job, um, and having poor coping strategies. So there are, are people that think, man, if I go see, it, well, how's it going to affect me on the job if I'm seeing a professional? It won't, but it's that stigma that it will. It's also the ignorance that people think that, man, what if they want to put me on medication? Well, it will not have an effect on the job, but it's still that stigma that people do not understand. And when we talk about the poor coping strategies, it's when people turn to alcohol and other drugs to numb themselves, make themselves feel good or try to feel better due to the trauma that they suffered at the job, the family disruption. You know, we we bring what affects us at work, we take home to our families, but also we have the same family issues without the, the issues of being policed that everyone else has in the community. And we bring them incidents to work. So someone may have had an argument with their, their significant other at 10 o'clock at home, come into work for midnight shift and one o'clock in the morning they're being called to a family that's having the same exact argument that they had two hours earlier. And that's where we talk about how the, the job and home life, they affect each other all the time. And it's when our worlds collide, it has a, a, a huge effect on us. Steve, can you go back a little and describe a um, knowledge of emergency petitions? Because I'm not sure that that terminology is widely understood. Sure. I know in different places, it's called different things. In Florida, it's called the Baker Act, but it's when a police officer, um, you could either say it, they have an obligation, a right, a duty, but if someone is a danger to themselves or others, to take them to a hospital to be evaluated by um, medical staff at the hospital to receive appropriate mental health treatment. And because of what, of police and fire being involved in that a lot, it sort of makes them hesitant to get help at the emergency room. Um, and think about the, the same people they're taking the community to, at times they're expected to go there themselves for help in the same exact situation. And it, it can be a huge deter deterrent for people to get help. Thank you. So PTSD often goes unnoticed um, and it often goes unaddressed um, and it is five times more likely in first responders than in civilians and that goes back to the dose response relationship we talked about. So first responders are getting bombarded day after day, sometimes hour after hour by traumatic events, often with no time to process in between. 
So therefore, the chance of PTSD um, is increased when someone is a first responder. Um, some characteristics of PTSD are intrusive thoughts. Um, so just they pop into your head um, unsummoned. Often um, at inopportune times, you have thoughts, visions of the traumatic event that's bothering you. Um, avoidance, so you may, if, if you responded to a bad car crash at first and main, perhaps first and main becomes a, uh, an area that you avoid going forward. Some people go to the extremes of um, never doing that activity again or staying far away from talk of that. And also um, another characteristic is physiological arousal. So that puts a person in PTSD in fight or flight all the time. So even if a person isn't actively thinking about the trauma, <clears throat> excuse me, their bodies and their brain chemistry is still in that fight or flight. Um, it's very taxing on the system and it's very uncomfortable for the person. And um, we need to make sure that when a person is diagnosed with PTSD, that they do have ways to bring their physiological back to baseline. Um, there are different ways people can do that with yoga and meditation and breathing, but they all require some effort. So trauma deals a strong blow to the ego, causing feeling a lack of control or being vulnerable and not being able to cope with future occurrences. Um, we talk about Superman syndrome. It's our type A personality that, you know, we have to be emotionally strong, physically strong. It's the survival of the fittest mentality to, to deal with adversity, that we don't want to show that we have weaknesses. So um, PTSD due to homicide of another officer increases the risk of suicidal thoughts by two and a half times. PTSD due to death, witnessing devastation, child abuse increases risk of suicidal thought by three times. And PTSD coupled with alcohol use increased the risk of suicidal thoughts 10 times. I had a former partner that under the influence um, of alcohol took his own life and another the same shift an officer that in retirement took his life after fighting alcoholism um and i i know when i saw what happened because of alcohol to them now we've talked about all the negatives that are there but now we're going to start and go into the protective factors and the and there's a lot of protective factors and we're going to then continue into what is the positive that's there of what are we doing and what can be done to help those in crisis? So a really important protective factor for somebody who may be suicidal um, is to take away the access of lethal means. So we talked about um, firearms being the number one um, cause of completing suicide. Um, another way is um, overdose, um, hanging, and jumping off bridges. So what we want to do is make sure that the people who are suicidal do not have access to any of these things. Um, oftentimes with first responders and police, um, we, we have to take their sidearm because it's not safe for them to have it. There's a procedure that has to be gone through um, and they can get it back later if they become stable. But oftentimes, even if it's just a civilian person who has a gun, um, or a knife or anything that you're afraid that they may try and um, complete suicide with, it's really important to take those things away from them. Um, that can be a very protective factor in keeping them alive and get them through this crisis and get them to the correct level of care. Another protective factor is to make sure that people have easy access to different varieties of clinical interventions. We want to make sure that if a person does want help, um, that they can get help. Sometimes the barriers to getting help are so great that people just give up before they even start. I know in the last two months, I've helped lots of people get help because when you're already in a state of emotional arousal, or physiological arousal, it's nearly impossible to navigate the system of getting help. So let's make it easy for people so that when they're in distress, they can just reach out and immediately the care is there for them.
Crisis intervention is a short-term helping process. Um, it's designed to stabilize and mitigate the crisis response, and it's not psychotherapy. Um, crisis intervention can be done with peers, and this is something that is very well um, done by peers. Um, certain populations don't have a trust of the medical community or the mental health community, um, don't want to speak to a shrink or a doc, but they will speak to their coworker. So we can train up peers and um, help mitigate the crisis response um, for people who are undergoing um, discomfort from a crisis or a trauma. An example of this is think in, in the civilian world of people in recovery and the success of peer support is in recovery and also in mental health treatment of having peers that, you know, we may not have walked in someone else's shoes, but as a friend of mine, Mark Junkerman says, I may have shopped in the same shoe store and in the same aisle. So the goal of crisis intervention is to foster our natural resiliency. Most people, most humans will naturally get through a crisis on their own and not require a higher level of care. If we do a few things, our first goal is to stabilize them, make sure that they are comfortable, they are fed and watered, they have gone to the restroom, they've changed out of dirty, wet clothing, um, and we've. Um, and then we're going to mitigate some symptoms, and we do that by educating them on some things that they can expect. You may have some intrusive thoughts. You may not be able to sleep. You may be not be able to eat. These things are all normal after a crisis. Um, we do some education pieces there, and then they will either return to their adaptive functioning, which is the way they were functioning before the crisis, or we can facilitate a higher level of care for them because sometimes people need just a little bit of help going forward, but most people will return to adaptive functioning. So it's important that we recognize that we have to target the person's crisis response, not the event itself. Um, that is the key. We have to look at the response the person is having. And we do that by looking at scope and magnitude. What happened, but what also is what the event was, but then what were the repercussions of the event, of the event? Because you can look at it and say, okay, there was a, a head-on collision. Not everyone's going to have the same crisis response because we don't know what the, the magnitude of what happened is. So you could have a head-on car collision and have no one injured. Or you could have a head-on collision where there's a where there's death. But then if you start throwing in the vulnerability of the people that are involved, if it's a head-on collision and one of them was a, a high school student or a small child, it adds, to, it, it makes the, the magnitude and increases the magnitude, which is likely to have an effect on that response of the person that is experiencing it. And it's not just the people that were seeing it, but think of, we start looking at the targets of everyone that you have to reach out to. People that witness an event that happens, family members of those involved, the community, and each incident itself. So you really have to look at the and develop a crisis action plan based on what is what the responses are to the people that it affects. And it can be overwhelming. So when we look at the Johns Hopkins resistance, resilience, recovery, um, outcome-driven continual care, the resistance of how do we develop a psychological body armor? Well, we do that through training. We do it by teaching classes of and under, people understanding their, their own resiliency, but understanding mental health in general, understanding trauma is what build it. One of the things we do in police department is through our training, we prepare officers for that they may experience the worst of the worst at times. That is all part of the psychological body armor that we have. And there's a lot of principles that are there that, um, that help with our resistance. It helps with our psychological body armor, knowing that when you know you did the right thing, so it was the right thing to do. 
it's when you re with um being driven to do the right thing then how do we what is our resiliency and that's also part of the training of how do we help ourselves when we get knocked down now part of it might be that we get a little bit of a helping hand to get up after the incident happens you get knocked down someone's there providing sizzle the critical and stress management the crisis intervention they're helping us get back on our feet and then we're up standing again but it's okay to know that part of it is the recovery aspect where we may have to get professional help it's all part of the recovery from that our crisis response to that incident and we're all human we've all had different experiences in life that's going to affect all of us different because today's event may be a trigger to something that happened years ago and that's part of being human so our solutions and this is the good part we're talking about one approach has been frequently used um, to integrate such an array of crisis, disaster, mental health interventions across the continuum of needs is critical incident stress management formulated by Dr. Jeff Mitchell in the 80s and expanded upon by Dr. Um, George Everly and others. It is a comprehensive, phase sensitive, and integrated multi component approach to crisis disaster intervention. Um, the day that the in a day that I'll never forget, June 28th, um, 2018, I, Michelle and I just finished teaching a GRIN class, which is the group and individual class together. Um, we taught police officers and other mental health professionals in, in the Baltimore area when I got a phone call that the Capitol Gazette shooting had just happened. And at first, I didn't have a lot of details. I just knew that it was a mass shooting and got there. And this is where we, that night, and I'm going through this really quickly, but we developed a strategic crisis action plan to reach out to everyone that was involved, that we had firsthand knowledge. We developed a plan to help all the first responders that were on the scene all the officers in my department that were there responded to annapolis city police that responded our sheriff's office that responded the survivors those that were in the newsroom that survived the incident the the victims who were who lost their lives and and how do we reach out to their families how do we reach out to the other employees of the capitol gazette who were the friends of the deceased who were not in the newsroom at the time what about the other employees of the building where it took place and the whole community as a whole? And we were able to follow the principles of CISM and come up with a strategic action plan utilizing all the different interventions at the right times to help as many people as possible. And I wanna mention that many of the um, people who were helping who were the helpers were peers. Most of the people who were helping were peers, um, who were helping the first responders. We had enough peers um, in each department to address the multitude of first responders who responded to the event. Um, and as well as um, several people coming from different jurisdictions to render mutual aid which we all do in the state of Maryland. We all help each other out when we have big events. Um, these are the six core elements of CISM, and um, I'm not gonna read them all to you. You can read them, but it's important to note that it's a circle and you can jump in anywhere. So if something has already happened, um, if there's already been an incident, then we start with our um, strategic planning and plan on how to respond to that incident, kind of thinking on your feet. That's the five T's, and I'll have Steve talk about that in a minute. Um, and then you start to do informational groups for people who are effective, interactive groups for people who are effective. Um, and then, but if you are able to um, plan it ahead of time and have a plan in place for when something happens, you would jump in at a different point and you'd start out with resilience training. 
Next slide. So in critical incident stress management there, it's, it's really an umbrella term to describe um, a variety of different interventions. Um, we do assessment and psychological triage, including initial surveillance. And that's just kind of watching and seeing how people are doing. Um, this is also known as mosey therapy, where um, you just sit and have a cup of coffee in the same room of people who are um, coming in from this uh, kind of critical incident. Or you can walk around and just chat with people and say, hey, how you doing? I'm Michelle. I'm here to talk if you want to. Um, the second um, item on here, individual crisis intervention. This is a one-on-one -on -one intervention. Um, and the main idea is to have psychological alignment and to actively listen to the person who is in distress. Um, and then you'll follow up with them um, the next day and maybe a couple times after that. Um, the next item we have is informational groups. There are two informational groups that fall under this. There's something called a RITS, Arrest Information Transition Service. This is for a prolonged event, and this is just kind of psychological decompression for large groups of rescue people and recovery people. It would be a room or a tent set up with food and drink. You give minimal information. Thanks for coming. We appreciate you being here and all your hard work. Have some snacks and drinks, and then go home and get some rest, and we'll see you in. 12 hours. The next group called the crisis management briefing is something that we do frequently um, when there are large um, amounts of people that we have to disseminate information um, in an easy way and in a quick way. Um, so in a CMB or crisis management briefing, we get everybody together. Um, it can be done in a large or a small group. Um, and it is a guided information session. Um, Steve, do you want to add anything to the CMB? No, but we, well, we at the Capitol Gazette shooting, um, Dr. Everly did one with our county executive that we put on the county TV channel and shared on social media to give information to the community. And it is really valuable because it, for one thing it does, it eliminates rumor, innuendo, but it's an opportunity to normalize people's reactions. You know, as humans, we'll be, we'll have our crisis reaction and we'll think it's just us. Not recognizing that everyone's going through the same, having the same reaction. We also give out um, informational flyers explaining the crisis reaction. The it's a sort of anticipatory guidance to anticipate what people are going to be going through. And it's sort of a relief when they read it and they're like, so this is what I'm going through. And yes, it's it's normal. It's anticipated that this is what's happening to me. Um, and they can be very powerful. We do them um, now after ma all major incidents in Anne Arundel County. If we have a barricade, we're reaching out to the community. When we have tragedies, we're reaching out. And really, it's we do a strategic action plan for each incident of what intervention is best to employ for that incident. So the CMB or crisis management briefing is really the fail safe um, when you have a group of people. Um, and oftentimes we fall back on the CMB when we are unable to do other kinds of interventions. The next type of groups that we have are interactional groups. We have diffusings, which are small groups, and that happens immediately after a critical incident. Um, before people have even really gone home or processed what has happened, it's it's quick. It's just want to check in, make sure you guys are doing okay, guys and gals. And um, these are some things you may be experiencing and um, get some rest. And then we're going to check back in with you tomorrow. Um, and then tomorrow we're probably going to do the next interactional group, which is called a critical incident stress debriefing. And this is a um, critical incident stress debriefing has several steps that we go through to, um, to uh, mitigate um, symptoms of distress, to normalize feelings, thoughts, and actions that um, people may be having after going through the critical incident and also kind of um, having the whole group together 
to talk about what happened um, also gives people a chance to fill in the blanks um, that they may have had tunnel vision during an incident and to hear that your colleague or your coworker was working on the same thing three feet away from you, but you didn't see it because you were completely focused on what you were doing. When the human brain doesn't know, when there's an absence of information, the human brain will fill it in with something horrible. So if we can have all the good information from everybody who was there, um, then this helps to um, process. A lot of people have a lot easier time processing once they have all the information from all the people who are there. And it lets them feel as if they're not alone in the feelings that they're having. So I'm gonna give two examples, um, and these are horrendous calls that we've responded to. One was recent, one was a few years ago. Both, both were similar in the fact that you had older um, siblings, took teenage siblings, took the life of a um, smaller, uh, of their younger sister. Um, and one happened about three or four months ago um, here where we were able to do a diffusing. And one of the things that inhibits the diffusing from happening is at what time in the shift does it happen? Because if we have to have all the officers have to be finished their mission. And what I mean by that, they have to be finished to call for service. If one of them is still on scene or writing a report, we can't do it. And we don't want to hold other officers over and take them away from going home, which could create animosity. So that's when we won't be able to do a diffusing, we'll do a CISD. However, in this case, it, the call was early in the morning. Before all the officers we were able went home, we were able to sit and do the diffusing. They were able to ventilate their feelings. And it was really important because one of the officers on scene, you talk about where the world collided, they had a child home the same age as the child that was the deceased, that was whose life was taken. And it really was important that we were able to do that because we sort of, um, as Dr. Mitchell will say, we sort of were able to, to take the fuse out of the bomb before that person went home. We were able to let them ventilate so that they could go home and love their family. And I know she went home and squeezed her children a little bit harder that night and loved them a little bit more. But the second one was one that happened late at night. The next day we were, when we went in, before everyone went to work, we were able to do the debriefing and we let them talk about what they experienced. And they opened up and I'll never forget one of the young officers saying, you know, I, I don't know if I could have reacted to anything at that moment because they, they were in distress. And it's one thing as officers, you know, our training takes us through the incident. And as we're working through it, our, our thoughts aren't, our thoughts are still stronger than our emotions because that's our training. But it's when our, when the call is over that our emotions take over. So, um, you want to talk about the five T's of the strategic planning, Steve? So as we go through and create a strategic action plan, we're going to, th first is our target. Who needs interventions? It could be individuals. It could be groups. It may be a shift. It may be a squad. It could be a firehouse. Um, it could be a community. It could be a school. It's, it can be, it's groups and individuals. The next are, what are the themes? It's the story behind the story. And it could be, and they're unlimited, it could be there. I mean, in the Capital Gazette, it was unlimited the amount of themes that were there because the amount of people that were affected, the, the part, part of it was is the media was affected, that the media themselves were the witnesses and victims of, firsthand victims of the incident. The next is, what type of intervention? Is it a one-on-one? -on -one? Is it a group intervention? And when it's a group intervention, what kind of intervention? Is it informational? Is it an interactive? The next is when can we appropriately do it? And some one of the things we learned at the Capitol Gazette, some of the interventions that we did, the first responders were not ready. Our timing was too early. That we had to give them time. They weren't emotionally or physically prepared for the intervention when we did it. And that was a lesson we had we, that we learned from that incident. 
And final is what team member is best to help? And a lot of times it's going to be who, who has been through something similar that can respond. Um, so it's really important that we recognize that. Then we get into fostering personal community resilience of what can we do. And a lot of it's through resiliency training and giving information to develop psychological body um, armor. So Dr. Um, Everly, in one of his books, talks about psychological body armor, the five factors of human resilience, the optimistic person, the person that's decisive, makes decisions, has a strong moral compass, is tenacious, and the, which may be the most important of all is has support, has social supports, has family, friends, but has a social support network to fall back on to give them help. So it, it, the challenge in crisis intervention is not only developing the tactical skills, but when to use them. And it's all part of utilizing the strategic crisis action plan. That's all part of the training. So the core competencies of conference, comprehensive crisis intervention the assessment, triaging, um, recognizing what is the expected res res psychological response someone has, or are they having extreme symptoms, utilizing strategic planning and utilizing integrated multi-component crisis prevention system, and make sure it's within the incident command system, utilizing one-on-one -on -one interventions, which is the most, um, you're going to use more than anything else of the one-on-ones but having small interactive um, group crisis intervention, large informational, and then also the follow-up, which is extremely important. So the ultimate goal of utilizing critical incident stress management and crisis intervention in general is to promote post-traumatic growth. So as you can see at the bottom of the arrow pointing down into distress and dysfunction, um, right next to it, there's an up arrow with growth because uh, distress and dysfunction and trauma and crises are often a catalyst for growth. We all know stories of people who took something extremely negative or something awful that happened to them and learned from it and poured it back into the community and are now a helping force for good. And they try and um, help others who've been through the same thing as them. So post-traumatic growth is, is the important um, goal that we all hope to achieve by doing the work of crisis intervention. So, and now you, I'm going to leave this up for a, for a moment. So if anyone wants to have um, to contact Michelle or I, here are our email addresses. And if anyone has any questions, We'll be happy to try to answer them. I think that's a Mackenzie or a Gabby because I can't open my chat window. Yep. Um, so thank you both for providing this critical information during this great time of need. And we would now like to open up the webinar for any questions that you may have. Remember that every participant will stay muted to avoid background noise but you can type your question into the question box at the right-hand side of the screen if viewing from a computer or at the bottom if viewing from a phone. If you have a question that you'd like to ask or if you have a comment about the webinar today, please enter that into the questions box now. And if we do not have time to answer each question today, we will provide our contact information at the end of the webinar for anyone who may wish to reach us. Um, so one question is, what do you do for officers who don't want to speak with the CISM team in fear that their business will be shared with other coworkers? So it's confidentiality is actually the, one of the um, biggest issues that we face. Um, it's, it's officers having confidence that it is confidential. And all we can do is reach out. Um, 
I can tell you that in our rule and reg for our department, um, breaching confidentiality through peer support can lead to termination um, from the department, which is written into the rule and reg. But it's um, all we, what we do is reach out and attempt, and we'll keep reaching out and let them know that we're here if they're ready to talk to us. Um, and that is always a concern that we have of officers being afraid of that. But it's just letting them know when they're ready to talk or when they're willing to talk that we are here or have somebody. The other part is it's key is it's having people through working throughout the department. It's not just in my unit and our crisis prevention team, but having their coworkers and on their shifts and creating a culture of helping within the police department where they'll have that faith that the peer, the peer member may be their side partner or someone that they know maybe not on their shift but on another shift and someone that they're they know in the district along with that question steve we had a question um surrounding the fear of losing their job the fear of getting their gun taken away from them um can you kind of talk to the stigma surrounding getting help when you do need help sure so and i think we've been pretty successful in um, we have officers that do openly talk about their um, that they go see a clinician and they talk about their experiences. And we had an incident where um, officers were on scene and someone took their life in front of the officers. And one of the officers involved in that incident had it's actually a military veteran had been involved in other incidents. And he openly talked to the other officers on the scene. He's like, I'm calling my clinician and making sure I, I'm getting an appointment tonight to go see him. Similar to what I said in the presentation about letting it where it is common, or I pray that one day we'll be able to, the people will openly talk about seeing their therapist like they would a occupational or physical therapist. And as we have success, that success grows. Absolutely. I think that as a new generation comes up and comes into the um, first responder community, the younger generation, millennials, um, have really speak of therapy and mental health, you know, all the time comfortably. So I think as that happens, there will be a cultural shift. And as the older guard kind of retires and moves out and younger people come in, that it will be more normalized, more accepted. Once it's more normalized, then it becomes part of the culture. And it, it has become a part of culture for us after a traumatic incident that we are going to be coming to the district and and talking to everyone. And if it's appropriate, we will be doing either a diffusing or a debriefing. Um, the supervisors on the shifts call us to make sure we know the incident happened. And it's, again, it's becoming part of the culture that we have. I know that this is something that we had discussed earlier, but we did have a comment about the Capitol um, Police officer who recently died by suicide. Um, and if you'd like to make some remarks on that. I mean, it's, um, we, I really don't know any of the details other than how horrific the events were at the Capitol last week, and knowing the effects that has on all the officers there, but not just on them, on their families. Think of the effects that children are home in virtual learning in a lot of places in this country right now. And if not, they probably were watching on TV in a schoolhouse. And think of in us being in the Maryland area, most of the children here are virtual. And can you imagine the child seeing that, knowing that their parent is a Capitol Police officer? And then the Capitol Police, when they experienced it and then going home and being there for their family and their family for them, it's extremely traumatic incident. Um, so, and I can tell you in the entire regional area, peer support teams have reached out to the Capitol Police to let them know we will have a regional response to help them through this and move forward. Um, so this question kind of relates to like everything going on in the pan pandemic. Um, did you find an increase for crisis intervention services in communities around the country 
because of all the stress that's occurring um, from COVID. So absolutely. So I can tell you for us here in Anne Arundel County, um, so we're sort of unique that I am a sworn police officer, but my office and I'm part of the crisis response system in Anne Arundel County. Um, and I can tell you firsthand, I had um, I had COVID early on back in March. Um, and I can tell you personally, I was in depression when I was in the hospital. I was in intensive care. Um, there's a video I, I made for ICISF talking about my recovery and how important it was for me and my family that my department took care of me, my family as I was sick. Um, with simple things as my family was quarantined, they did a meal train for my family. While I was in the hospital, while I was in ICU, as well as when I came home and was still recovering. Um, and it has definitely had an effect. One of the things I talked about with Dr. Everly um, with psychological body armor is social supports. Well, when we're social distancing, it's limiting our ability to utilize our social supports. And it's even tough when you're there in person, social distancing with a mask on. It's just not the same person to person contact. Um, and there are times on calls that it's just natural, it's natural to give a hug, which isn't occurring. So it's definitely having an effect on everyone in our response and how people are affected um, by the pandemic. Um, I think also just in the general population, just civilians, um, most of us have been utilizing our regular coping methods. And I feel like there a lot of people are suffering more now because their usual coping mechanisms have begun to fail them. They're not finite. People don't have finite energy to um, to um, cope. So um, people are now getting really creative with different ways to connect. Um, you know, online sing-alongs and all the Zoom parties and outside activities. But people are also kind of beginning to be over it enough where they're doing things that, in spite of um, what the medical professionals are telling us to do. Um, and that's because our coping mechanisms are exhausted. So um, we do have to all kind of reset and recommit because, we're, you know, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. It's really little and far away, but we'll get there. Um, so if we can all just hold on, but um, definitely if people need mental health, um resources absolutely get a hold of of one of us or call your local um crisis response team in howard county it's grassroots um they can also refer you to other um county help in maryland um but there there is low cost and no cost mental health care available for anyone it just requires seeking it out and if you're in a real emergency, you can call 911 or go to the emergency room because we don't want anybody to feel so alone that that they decide that completing suicide or hurting themselves or taking their own life is an option. That's it's devastating to the community and, and to their loved ones. So we just want to make sure with the prolonged COVID that people know that we're all struggling and that there are resources out there available for help. Are there any national resources that you would recommend? Um, we have the suicide, um, the National Suicide Hotline. Um, they're still working on the, I don't remember what, 999, I think, was a legislation that was going through. Um, Steve, can you look up, do you have a resource to look up the phone number for the National Suicide? Well because we're on our computer, so we can't look anything up right now. But um, even local, you can call 311 in a lot of um, areas, and that's the police non-emergency line. And if you call 311 and say, I'm in trouble, um, they can refer a clinician or a police officer or a clinician police officer team to come out, or they can give you the phone number. I think it, you can Google um, suicide resources um, here, at Nami, here at Nami <laughs> Island, we also have support groups and programming um, for anyone that is struggling and um, 
our phone number is 410-884-8691. And we also have a helpline where we can help direct you to um, local community resources. Um, Anne Arundel County has the warm line, which um, is the same kind of resort, will direct you to resources. Steve, what's the warm line number? It's 410-768-5529. And the National Suicide Prevention um, Lifeline is 800-273-8255. And for people who um, want to just text, because I know that's very important for a lot of um, the population, they can text 741-741, and that will get them a, um, a clinician to talk about um, if they're in crisis and they can just, they just text. They never have to talk to anybody. They can just text. So 741-741. Gabby, is there a next question for us? You're muted, Gabby. <laughs> um, about dealing with people or members who may be struggling, but who are avoiding indicated help by other people? Um, police or first responders or civilians? How? Um, just ask the members, so I'm not. Uh, okay. I believe it would be related to first responders. So for first responders, um, critical incident stress management interventions are never required. Um, they are always optional. They're, they're recommended, but we never make somebody um, participate in an intervention if they don't want to or don't feel like they're ready. Um, sometimes we can convince people to attend if it's an interactive intervention by saying you don't have to talk but something that you say can be important to one of your colleagues who may be struggling in this group. So by you being there and saying something or just your presence could be helpful to somebody else. And a lot of times people will do that because they do care about their coworkers. And we we always give out, it's a handout that we have, it's two standard ones. And they talk, they, they talk about the expected crisis reaction. I know I said it in the presentation, but it's important. It's something that they can take home. And even if they don't take it in at the moment, they can reflect back to, to understand and normalize their reactions. Um, and we have a separate one of how can they talk to their children and help them help their children after a traumatic incident. Wonderful. Um, and I know that we are a little bit over, but we do have a lot of questions. So if you if you would like to log off, feel free to do so. We have recorded this webinar and we will um, be sending that out to everyone um, who has registered. And it will also be posted on our website at www.namimd.org. Um, but for now, we'll just take a few more questions because I know a lot of people do have those. Um, so Gabby, would you like to go ahead and ask our next question? Mm -hmm. So this one is about becoming a 911 dispatcher and if you would recommend the same solutions and finding similar clinical help for that. So we do reach out to our dispatchers um, and we have members, or we've trained members of our communications um, staff or communications uh, operations as uh, members of the team. Um, but after critical incidents, we do because one of the things that affects them is they have less closure than when patrol happens. And they will hear firsthand what is happening. Um, they're picturing it in their mind as they're hearing it. So we reach out to them after the incidents as well. Um, and then another, is there evidence that debriefings reduce arousal and facilitate recovery? Yes, um, we do have, um, books and articles and um, research studies that have been empirically um, driven that we can provide if anybody is interested in that. Um, it has to be done correctly. Um, now, if it's done incorrectly, it can harm 
the possibility of harm exists. So that's why we have to to mitigate the possibility of harming someone or ourselves as interventionists, we have to follow the model and we have to be fully trained. So something that Steve and I do and that there's training available um, from the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation, he's holding up the book there. Um, we train people so that the model is followed and that it, if the model is followed, it reduces the chance of of harm and it makes the success rate higher. So I can't read the title of that book. It's critical, critical incident stress management and psychological crisis intervention, a practical review of research. And it's um, Dr. George S. Everly um, is the author of the book. Dr. Everly is one of the creators of modern CISM with ICISF and he is a professor at Johns Hopkins University. The book would be available on the ICISF website from the bookstore um, if anybody's interested in that and has several studies that show the efficacy of um, critical incident stress management. Um, this question is about that you mentioned that, that officers may, may use the same services as the communi community but why don't they have in-house support? So we do, that was part, that was one of the, um, as part of the presentation of why officers will not go out to traditional mental health services. Um, but we do have as through our peer support team and every jurisdiction does it differently. Um, in Prince George County Police, they actually have a psychological services where they have clinicians that work for the department. Um, for in Anne Arundel County, I'm a crisis response as part of the system team. Well, we will link them to services in Baltimore County. Uh, Sergeant Chuck Hart um, is there is the the, their, the head of their peer team. Where again, he will link people to uh, additional services. And there are mental health professionals who specialize just in seeing first responders. Um, there are several in the area. Um, contact one of us if you would like their information. There is oftentimes a waiting list because the need is so great that um, first responders generally want to see first responder specific mental health professionals because they already have the knowledge. They don't have to explain themselves to the, the as great an extent because the person already understands the lingo, the vernacular, the lifestyle and all the issues and problems that go along with being a first responder. So that kind of goes back to that last question. So there are specific people that first responders can see. And, and this actually leads into next month, Steve Plummer, a clinician that we refer um, a lot of people to in Anne Arundel County Police. Um, he and I are doing a, a webinar presentation on how do we do that soft handoff um, and how does he, at, how is, is it different um, helping a, a civilian versus a um, first responder? I'm going to go ahead and add that registration information into the chat now if anybody would be interested in registering for that webinar. And just as a reminder, most people who receive critical incident stress management services and interventions, most people do not end up needing a higher level of care but sometimes people do. And when they do, we have that safety net that we're able to refer to a higher level of care. And so they can seek outside professional services. Gabby, are there any other questions for our speakers? Um, I am looking. <laughs> I know we got bombarded by questions, so be patient That's with awesome. us. <laughs> We have questions. <laughs> um, this is about have you ever you had to use your CIT on any of your colleagues and was the training helpful for the incident? So <clears throat> we um so you not only use it um the so the, there's a difference between crisis so the CIT training is different than the SISM training. The SISM is more detailed, um, but you don't just use it on your colleagues. You use, use it to help to be a better person. 
to be a better father, a better husband. It's listening skills. Um, it's um, you use it all the time. You're taught not just the procedures of that, but how do you listen non-judgmentally? And the training teaches you how to do that, to be unbiased. It actually also teaches you how to build on a build a relationship with somebody um, and help with empathy. Um, that's why it takes so long and there's no shortcuts for the training. Um, so it's not just with first responders, it's an everyday life. It's a life skill that can be used. So yes, we use all the training all the time <laughs> on, on, um, on first responders. See that the link I sent out isn't working. I think it's because I have the period in it. So let me go ahead and send that out to Ken. That should work for everyone. Sorry about that. Any other questions, Gabby, before we close? I think that might be the last that I have. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. This webinar again has been recorded and it will be sent out to everyone who registered today. Um, it will also be sent um, and uploaded to our website at www.namimd.org. Um, we hope that this webinar has been helpful for you. And um, let me see here close out my questions tab. <laughs> um, and at the end of the webinar today, again, you'll be directed to a survey where we hope that you will let us know what you found was helpful, what could have been improved, um, because again, this is just one in a webinar series of first responder mental health that we plan on doing. Um, we hope that you'll join us for our next webinar. And if you are looking for CEUs for Maryland Emergency Medical Service workers, police, and corrections. You will need to complete the entire survey for us to complete those CEUs for you. Each person that completes the um, survey will also be registered to win a $25 Amazon gift card. And um, we plan to host these four more webinars between now and April surrounding topics of recovery, creating a peer support team, cumulative trauma, and compassion cultivation. We wish you all a safe and healthy rest of your week, and please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions or any concerns about the webinar today. Um, our phone number is 410 884 86 Nine one. should you need any additional resources or support. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, have a great day.